Gail, how long have you been in LA? Oh, since college, I went to Loyola. So the, the 70s, time. rest of my family's in San Diego, which is, you know, a little too laid back for me. Nice, beautiful place. But um, after spending four years here for school, I said, let me stay here in LA. So I love LA. I love to visit LA, honestly. I couldn't live in LA, but I. And that's what a lot of people say now. <laughs> Even people who live here, so yeah. Well, back in the day, pre-COVID, I was visiting LA with quite regularity, at least once okay. a month for work. Mm -hmm. And uh, in COVID, mm -hmm. it's been a while. Yeah. David, how about you? How long have you lived in Atlanta? Fifteen years. Yeah. And I moved from Los Angeles. Wow, it's been that long. Wow. Yeah. And I moved from Los Angeles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's, uh, time flies. We were just talking about how quickly the time has expired. It's flown past. You've not picked up a Southern accent in those 15 years. I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> I want to maintain my, uh, my New York City route, if nothing else. Um, but As you can hear from my accent, I've been in the South my whole life. Mm, well, I married a Southern girl, so hey, I, what can I say? I got nothing against the South, and so in that respect. Do you know Brian Calhoun down there? No, I don't. I'll introduce you. Brian is one of my music industry heroes. Um, he's a, an upcoming guest on this program. Okay. He's, he's worked with everybody in the industry. Um, Everybody from Kanye to, uh, you know, you name the A-lister, he's worked with them. Okay. Great guy. I'll, I'll introduce you. Okay, let's get this party started. Um, welcome to the 10th installment of The Smartest People in the Room. If you've been following this series, you know that I've been leaning into the notion of the room by broadcasting my portion from various live music venues around Nashville. Today, I'm excited to be in one of my happy places, City Winery. City Winery has been the home for the Who News series for the past four years, hosting all of our Nashville in-person events. I'm sitting in the lounge, which is the upstairs performance venue that hosts smaller, more intimate events than the main room downstairs. And the reason I'm up here is downstairs in the main room, they are setting up for the second night of Streaming Strings with Billy Strings, which you can purchase a ticket by going to streamingstrings.com. It starts a virtual performance at 6.30 tonight, 6.30 Central, so tune in for that. During COVID, City Winery's Barrel Room Restaurant and Patio is open with socially distanced seating, and on Friday and Saturday nights, they have local musicians performing from 7 to 9 p.m. on their beautiful outdoor patio. Seating on the patio is very limited, so please visit the City Winery website to get your reservation now. City Winery is also getting ready to start presenting shows again in the main venue, also with socially distanced seating and, for, and a robust wellness and safety plan in place. Visit the City Winery website for a full listing of upcoming reduced capacity seating summer shows, as well as full details on how they are reopening a safe place for music. City Winery also has an online wine shop and you can stop by in person to buy locally made delicious wines. Free shipping in Tennessee when you buy six bottles or more. So before we get started with the formal program, I want to thank all of our sponsors for without their support, we could not do what we do. First, thanks to First Horizon Bank, Buffkin Baker, which you may know is the search firm that I work for. I'm a music industry headhunter and I place executives just like the two guests that we have on our program today in jobs across the industry. I want to thank also Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and also Organics. I really appreciate you guys supporting these great supporters of me. Today's guests on the smartest people in the room are well known in many circles. Today's host is one of the most respected and decorated journalists in the entire music industry, Ms. Gail Mitchell. Gail serves as Billboard's executive director of hip hop, R&B, 
covering the R&B and rap genres as well as music industry news for the magazine and billboard.com. She's moderated panels and keynote Q&As for industry organizations and companies such as ASCAP, BMI, the Recording Academy, the Grammy Museum, the Revolt Music Conference, the Music Business Association, Warner Records, and Medem Digital 2020. She's also represented Billboard in, in stories and broadcast interviews for most major media outlets, including CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, USA Today. Guys, you get the idea. She is all over the place and is a decorated journalist. Mitchell holds a bachelor's degree in communications from Loyola Marymount University in LA. She's also the 2014 recipient of the Living Legend Foundation's Living Legends Foundation's Media Award and the 2013 recipient of Loyal Amount Marymount's Quad A William L. Strickland 71 Excellence Award. Her music industry service also includes two terms as national trustee representing the Los Angeles chapter of the Recording Academy. Mitchell was honored at the Facebook and Instagram second annual Women in Music Grammy Week luncheon in 2020. She was also most recently presented with the Outstanding Excellence in Journalism Award by the Black Business Association in Los Angeles. Welcome, Gail. <laughs> also joining Gail on today's program is our special guest, Mr. David Linton, a seasoned executive with a career encompassing in journalism, radio broadcasting, and recorded music uh, pr promotion and marketing. David Linton is truly a unique personality. His ability to create lead and organize is the hallmark of his illustrious career. He most recently was appointed program director for Jazz 91.9 WCLK, owned by Clark Atlanta University, one of the country's leading jazz stations. He's also chairman of the Living Legends Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that recognizes today's music executives serving black the black music community and providing assistance to the needs of music industry professionals who have fallen on difficult times. Linton has been honored over the years for his many accomplishments in, in record and broadcasting industries as well, his civic community, his civic and community endeavors. He has platinum and gold awards representing over 90 million records and CDs sold for projects he's promoted and marketed. As senior VP of R&B promotion and marketing at Capitol Records, Linton was selected as by then President Roy Lott to help return Capitol Records to urban music arena after seven years absence. Linton joined Capitol after a successful five year stint as VP of R&B promotion at Arista Records, then headed by the legendary Clive Davis. During his tenure at Capitol, Linton organized the infrastructures which led to Capitol scoring its first platinum act in the urban arena in almost eight years. While at Arista, Linton helped propel the careers of such A-listers as Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Kenny G, TLC, Tony Braxton, and helped launch the careers of such platinum artists as Next, Deborah Cox, Puff Daddy, Total, and the late notorious B.I.G. and Usher. His efforts helped make both Bad Boy Entertainment and LaFace Records become iconic brands in the music industry. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome David Linton and Gail Mitchell into the smartest people in the room. Please take it away, guys. Well, thank you, Tom, for that great uh, introduction on my behalf. And um, David, it's good to see you. It's been always, a minute. It's you been know, a minute. Always good to see you. And thank you too, Tom. I'd like to thank Tom also for this uh, opportunity. Um, and, but I'm still trying to figure out who's the smartest people in the room. It must be you <laughs> and Tom. <laughs> exactly, that was my thoughts too. <laughs> All right, so uh, after everybody's heard what Tom said about your background there, um, David, um, and I know you from your days at Capitol when you were here in LA, but talk a little bit about what the in record industry was like then versus now. Well, I think there's, one thing about the music industry is, is forever evolving like everything else. And the more things change, the more they remain the same, uh, to use some cliches. <laughs> but I think the difference between the industry then and now is one is size. Um, the industry was bigger. Um, mm -hmm. There were more labels. Um, there were more opportunities for um, jobs, artists, et cetera. I mean, you know, when I used to first 
um, when I started in radio and even when I transitioned to the music industry, when I picked up Billboard, the first place I would go to musical chairs. <laughs> 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 musical chairs was that section where you could see who was moving around. So right. if somebody was out with CJ, it might be a job possibility for you somewhere <laughs> else. Um, and of course, obviously, you know, you had, um, like I said, more labels. And with the more labels, you had obviously the more opportunity. And I think as the industry changed and um, contracted, um, downsizing, less labels, less jobs, less opportunities. So I think that's one of the big things. I think also, um, Music was more about the feel. I think when a &R guys or radio people heard a song, uh, they felt the song, they either signed it or were ready to invest in it. Um, now everything is about, you know, some kind of equation, you know, how many, spin, how many downloads, how many followers. <laughs> so, you know, it's become more uh, mathematical when it's not just a bean counter saying, you know, how many records are we gonna sell? I think it's become a little bit more corporate across the board. You know, that's good. It is a business. I understand that, but I, I think that's the biggest change. Um, and also um, one of my pet peeves is there's uh, less people of color available. Um, although there seems to be a little resurgence here and there, but I just think that that's one of the biggest differences is uh, size and with that size came everything else. Okay. Uh, talk a little bit about, um, it, as we know, um, Amir was put up to, uh, in front of the music industry in the wake of George Floyd in the calls for uh, racial equality. Um, and show must be paused, Blackout Tuesday, you know, that's in systemic bias for, for Black, the Black music community and the music industry. So wanted to get your, your perspective on that. Is that one of the things you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago, seconds ago, I should say that you, the lack of Black um, employees that you saw, and especially from my end, what I saw, it, it, you know, in terms of executives, advancement, that sort of thing, especially uh, when Black music really came to a, a height of prominence there in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s and, and now has, has had a big resurgence since, what, 2017 with the streaming. But is there, do you think, do you see a real opportunity for real reform at this point in time? Well, you know, I think um, there's always room for re reform. It depends on if people want to reform. Mm -hmm. um, I think the music business has always been a microcosm of the greater society. Um, there's nothing, um, you know, music is really, you know, the music industry is kind of schizophrenic, if, if I can use that. There's sort of a, a civil kind of complex. You know, we all party together, we all hang together, we do this right. together. But when it comes to sharing the power, sharing the money, then it's, that's when we, it kind of contracts. You're like, oops, no. And the difference, as we were talking about the 70s and the 80s, when black music, uh, you know, let's talk about the history of the music industry as it relates to, you know, black, black music. And I like, I like the term black, and we'll probably talk about the other term later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when the black music divisions were developed in the 70s, um, it was an opportunity for major companies to get into black music. I mean, it, so it hired people who knew the music, who knew and had the connections and could do it. And so, and it grew, and, and by doing so, it, the industry flourished. And it, it also allowed the people who wanted to do rock to do rock. It allowed the people who wanted to do uh, country to do country. Um, I don't subscribe to the term pop because popular music is, is that I think any music that sells a lot is popular. So I've always had a problem with what we call pop music. Um, but at the same time, I think when those things were initiated um, back in, in the 70s, it opened the doors for a lot of creativity. It was, uh, it was a financial boom. We had our own um, economical structure. The companies were able to benefit. Everybody was having fun, making money. <laughs> you, know, you know, there was also, um, you know, conferences. We could go and we could socialize. Deals were made. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of those things that were happening, and I don't want to go too far and lose your, the question, but right. again, um, you know, I think those are the things that are, are, are missing, and it will, we're always going to circle back to that, that, that change in that time, because that was when culture was really 
was flourishing. You know, people wanted to do soul music, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Um, at that particular time, there's always been the, the change of names. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> So you do think real reform is, and do you feel more hopeful versus when you were there in the music industry in terms well, you know of what? what you <coughs> I think, but I think, well, yeah, thank you for bringing me back to the reform. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, you know what? Like I said, again, people would want to reform. I think there's opportunity, yes, because the music business, like every other business, went through a down cycle. And there now, there's millions. Money's flowing again. You know, like, you know, we talk about, the economy is growing again, things are going. So I think there's an opportunity. Now, it depends on if those who are making the money want to reinvest it, how they want to reinvest it. Do they want to reinvest in um, people, new businesses, new opportunities, or do they want to just keep it the same and shell the profits? So, you, you know, one thing that I think, and I don't want to give it the, the quote to someone that doesn't deserve it, so I won't say a name, but you, you know, you can't legislate equality. You have to want to do it, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. Right. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, an opportunity, I think there is. Um, and there's an easy blueprint that's been laid out for labels to follow um, if they really want to do that. Um, everybody knows that <clears throat> Ron Sweeney, the attorney, wrote this letter, The Elephant in the Room. Um, and when he laid out in his letter, he actually gave a nice blueprint um, for change. And if anybody really wants to do that, I think that is really a real comprehensive guide. You may not want to follow it step by step, but the guide the plan, because it's so easy to do if you really want to do it. Okay. Do you think the issues that are being discussed today in terms of ending systemic bias in the music industry um, where can you talk about some of the couple of things that you might have had to be that you were challenged by as a black man in, in the uh, in the industry back then? Uh, is it some of the same things that people are talking about today? Some you know thirty years later. Well, I think um, I think some of the things are the same. Um, you know, personally, I you know there is, and this is a personal thing, and sometimes I'm criticized for saying it. You know. Um, I understand, once you understand you BIA, Black in America. So I, I've always known, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, you know, came, you know, hard working blue collar family. Um, and I always knew that I had to run fast to jump higher. <laughs> that, that's just, <laughs> yeah. under, I understood it. So once you understood the rules, I, I didn't allow myself to be, to quote, be victimized. Um, mm -hmm. But I did understand that if I, Whatever I did, I had to do better and quicker and faster than my, my white counterpart. That's just, that's just how it is. Um, and when I say that to my white counterparts, they go like, what do you mean? And then when I explain to them, they go like, oh, well, you know, I never thought about it like that. And it's, it is, and it's, it's a natural. People gravitate to their own. That's, a, that's just laws of nature. But one thing that, you know, when I was in my issues, were not as bad because I had black music divisions and the business industry was bigger. So I had uh, somebody who brought me into the business, Ray Harris or Ernie Single to help brew me and train me. And then I was like in a finishing school, if you will. And then when I was able to strike out on my own, um, but they were still a phone call away. There was always somebody who, and it wasn't always about the competition. It was about how can I help that person be successful? So we had community. Um, I think today, without that same kind of infrastructure, um, young executives don't have that same kind of resource. And, and that's one of the things we want to do through the foundation is become that resource. Um, because we've, the foundation, as you alluded to, uh, Tom mentioned, Living Legends Foundation, we were founded um, by the executives who actually were the ones who were a part of that first wave of Black music industry. And, and so they've seen the pitfalls, the highs and the lows. And so, because the game hasn't changed. You know, the, the game plan does, hasn't changed. You know, music doesn't, music changes. Um, the biggest thing that's changed is the delivery system. Content is right. pretty much still, you got to have a good song. It all starts with a song and it's got to be a good song. <laughs> exactly. And you go from there. Okay. 
Uh, before we move further, I wanted to give a couple of shout outs. James, C uh, James Leach from CSAC is on, and I know you know James, and also James. Miller London, who you, you know from uh, Motown days, right? Oh, yeah, Miller London. When, when I, see, when I talked about Miller London, James Leach, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's also a good example. How are you, how you doing, fellas? Thanks for reaching and touching us. Um, Miller, when I came into the industry, Miller was one of those guys who said, hey, you need something. When I got my first VP job in New York at um, Polygram, which became Island Def Jam, the, the morphing of that company, um, Miller was also at A&M. We just wound up happened to be in New York at the same time, same building. He's like, yo, you need anything? I got you. And I, I met him earlier through networking, through Ray Harris, the people who they said, you need to know this person. This is the person you need to know. So we put each other in contact and then we become family. And uh, actually, Miller actually thinks my house is his house. Um, <laughs> and when I go to Detroit, his house is my house. So, you know, right. hey, that's, that is really family. And then James is, is a part of that, the, the, the few African-Americans who have been able to break through in the publishing world. You know, everybody knows the success and we're very proud of uh, Chairman and CEO John Platt over at Sony ATV. But that was a world that was really kind of not really open to, exactly. um, to African-American executives. You could be a promotion executive. Uh, you can like do marketing and you could probably do publicity. Publicity, yeah. But, you know, but the a &R thing was always kind of, you was always a junior scout, <laughs> if anything else. <laughs> but you, wasn't, they, you weren't always given the right to sign the checks and bring the, bring the bands in or, or whatever. So, you know, it's just those little things. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, one question I see here it has a name I know you know. I don't know. Maybe you've got an anecdote or two about him, or at least you can talk about his importance to the black music industry. Is Clarence Avon? Oh, Clarence Avon. Um, you know the the Godfather. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Clarence is um, has always been a um, person that I, I I met when I moved to LA. Always, I was a reader. I'm a nerd, I'm, but I'm a cool nerd. I always tell people I'm a nerd, but I'm a cool nerd. <laughs> I always like to read. So I knew about all these people in the industry and I like had my little hit list of people that I wanted to meet and, and find out. And I eventually got the chance to, uh, to meet um, Clarence through Brenda Andrews. Uh, Brenda yeah, explain Andrews. who Brenda is though. You Number, need to I was getting ready to say, okay. Brenda Andrews. People don't know, Brenda Andrews used to work at A&M Records and she was in A&R. She was in publishing. She's probably the first black woman, right. uh, yeah. black woman to do publishing and do it well and do it big. And she groomed the big Johns of the world and the, the Jane Leaches. And so I got to meet her through mutual friends, being living in LA, um, through my bosses, Ray Harris, and then my other good friends, Eddie Sims and Belinda Wilson. Um, so we got to meet and we found a, a community. Um, and it was through her that I met Clarence Avon. And Clarence then, um, and Joey Bonner, a person from a historian that, you know, people in black music should know. If you don't, there's certain names that we may talk about that if you don't know those names, that's why we have a Living Legends Foundation. Um, they introduced me and put me in. They said, he's a good kid. They gave me the, I was the good kid. I was the kid at that time. And, <laughs> and it was okay, you know. Uh, I, I'll take being a kid when it's the Clarence Avon. And, and then Clarence was able, one of those guys that I could pick up and have a conversation with. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget the day that I was getting ready to be, when Capital was going through all of his changes. And I was like, Clarence, how can you help me? Can, where can we move, you know, find another job? And um, Clarence says, because my performance was good, I couldn't understand it. And Clarence says, you're just making too much damn money. That's how much why <laughs> they're gonna let you go because you make too much money. And he was like, huh, I'm making too much money. But um, again, that was when the, the company was, was getting ready to downsize. So they got rid of me and brought three people in, you know, so, wow. yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so why don't we at this point, because we're talking about legends, talk a, little, talk a little bit about it in school people about living legends, because a, a lot of folks, when I bring it up, uh, I know usually I see you once a year in October. You, you're, you're the, it's a great organization. I got an award from you guys, so thank you again. But talk a little bit about the history, how long it's been around and what it is you're trying to do. And especially in relation to one of the, um, uh, 
ideas that Ron Sweeney put forth in his letter about there's seasoned people out here who can help and are still viable and, and vital and, and how necessary they are. Well, you know, I, I love talking about the Living Legends Foundation. It's, it's funny because, uh, and, and before I get it, because it's funny because the, the day when somebody told me that, well, you know what, you, you, you're not in touch, you're, you're too old. But the person who told me that was almost damn near 90. <laughs> 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 no, but the Living Legends Foundation is a great organization. It was founded in 1991 by Ray Harris, um, who was at the time senior vice president of uh, Black Music at uh, Warner Brothers, and uh, Jerry Bolden. It started at who was then the, the urban editor at um, Urban Network. And Jerry Bolden is probably one, is not probably the best program directors, black or white, in the country uh, at the time. He's no longer with us. But he was the guy that I was fortunate, even when I was a, a young programmer, I got to meet him at one of those mini conventions, Jack the Rapper in Atlanta. And again, somebody just said, he's a good kid. So he, he was one of those guys that took me out of the way and taught me radio programming. Right. But the Living Legends Foundation started out as a, as a luncheon at one of his conferences. And it was designed um, by Ray Harris, who had the vision to honor the people who work in the music industry, but behind the scenes. Artists have the Grammys. Um, actors have Oscars and everything, but the people who work behind the scenes, I like to call us the star makers. We don't have a platform. We just get kind of, you know, we become footnotes. And especially in black music, um, it was so important because there were so many people who broke those glass ceilings and kicked down doors and went through side windows for us to be able to enjoy the careers and lifestyles that we've had in this business. And so Ray started honoring those people. And while we were at um, Warner Brothers Records, I've been with the foundation ever since it started, 29 years. And the only reason I started initially because my boss <laughs> was setting it up. I had no choice, but it was such a great um, venture um, that, I stayed with the entire time. And what the foundation did, another thing that we always found out um, was that there was always people who found themselves in need because the record industry was one of those places where you, everybody did make millions of dollars. You didn't get 401ks at the time. So nobody got, you get two weeks severance if you had that. You, and so people were always fi finding themselves in need. And when you look at someone who's had a great career and has helped an artist or who become a superstar or helps a, a label make millions of dollars and then he or she can't you know, pay their rent or pay their medical bills, that's a travesty. Mm -hmm. And so when we started giving out awards, we also used to give a stipend. That was sort of like, you know, we award you, give a stipend. And that went for a number of years. Um, and the great thing about the industry is that we had all of those many heads of black music. And so they all bought in and supported us. You know, we needed a table, they bought a table, they bought a table. And so we started to having this dinner um, at all of these conferences um, and we grew. Um, and then when the industry contracted, um, we found ourselves without all those people at those labels to help us write those checks. And we had to become more creative. Um, and so we were able to continue to keep the, um, the mission um, and even through the thin times. And we now, 29 years later, are still strong. We now continue to honor people because if I call the name Harry Coombs, who I see in the room, who knows who Harry Coombs is? They would say, who is that? But if I said, if I said Gamble and Huff, Teddy Pendergrass, um, the OJs, you know, they would go, yeah, I know those artists, but that's the guy who promoted and marketed them. That's the guy who brought them to the forefront. Gamble and Huff had the songwriting team, but it was the Harry Coombs of the world who put them on the map, who took, you know, so when you see that, we have to honor those people. I, I see Cynthia Johnson, who's in the room, Cynthia Johnson, okay. she's, uh, she's a legacy, you know, exactly. her, her father, um, you know, was one of the key executives at, at Atlantic Records back in the day. Um, 
And, and then she followed in her, 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 his, his footsteps. And she was a senior executive at Columbia Records uh, back in the day when they friends Sony and CBS and all that. We go through all those metrics. But you know, if we, those are the people who are so instrumental to this industry. So we want to recognize them. We need to recognize their legacy so that people know that what they did matter. You know, nobody's going to write our story but us. And nobody's going to tell our story but us. And so that's what the living legend does. And so now we've been able over the years, you know, just got a call yesterday from a, a, a prominent um, artist manager um, who, who, just, who was deceased, family of his man who deceased, um, but didn't have, doesn't have the money that they need for a proper burial. In the COVID-19 world, it's even more crazy. And so they were able to come to the foundation. And one thing that we know, when people come to us, we are the last resort because people have pride. It's the last yeah. thing people want to do is to say, I need assistance. And so we do it in a very discreet way. No one's ever, you know, we never tell anybody's business. Um, so it's, again, that is what we do. And now the next thing that we've done in the last two, three years we're starting is we've started a scholarship program because now it's time to pay forward. You know, we want to recognize our past, but then we got to help the current generation of people. And so obviously we're trying to connect with our historically black colleges. I'm a, I'm a graduate of two historically black colleges, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, got my master's degree at North Carolina Central. And now I work for a historically black college, the Clark Atlanta University, um, in the AU Center, what they call the Atlanta University Center, which encompasses Spelman and Morehouse. And, and majority of um, African-American kids uh, who have degrees and doctors, uh, they start at um, historically black colleges. They may wind up going somewhere else, but they start at HBCUs. And so we want to pay back with that. So that is our next thing. And the other thing is that we have a foundation that's full of still vibrant executives and marketing executives who can't get back in because of whatever. We, some, some of it's racism, some ageism, which was against the law, but, but it's there because they say this is a young hip building business. But, and, I, and I love him because I had a great time working for him, Clive Davis, but no one's ever telling Clive that he's too old to work. Very true. You know, and I, and I had to preface it because, you know, my four years, five years with Harrison was really great. Uh, Mo Austin, I work with some of the great music executives um, of our time, but nobody's told them that they were too old, but they can come and tell me that I'm too old or tell you you're too old or somebody that I have an issue with that. And so we're part of a foundation that has some great, great people. Um, and, you know, when we think about other women like a, Mike Bernardo, people don't know who a Mike, Mike Bernardo no, know. is, but they should know who she is. She's the one who made it possible for us to have a Sylvia Rome, you know, you know, running promotions departments and, and helping people. We used to call her mom because we all came in and she gave us, you know, took us under her wing. And so the foundation is really dedicated to doing and taking care of those people. And, you know, we want to continue to do that. You know, and we are registered 501c3 nonprofit. Um, books are open, been clean. 30 years with the only, with the longest standing organization serving the African American community. Now, others went by with, for whatever reasons, but we have maintained our integrity and we are open to continuing to do that. Our board, we have a, a board of directors, uh, we have an advisory board, and it's all voluntary. Nobody gets paid for doing it. That's the beauty of what it is. Nobody is saying, you know, I'm doing this and I need, we got, no everybody who's been in that foundation and we've had some changes over the years because people burn out get tired right. and i and i if you have to shut me up about talking about the foundation because right. i love it because right. this is what we this is what we're about okay yeah. well tom uh i noticed in the chat room he sent it to everybody in the chat room and all the attendees the uh uh website address so there's that but let folks know that usually you have a dinner the dinner's every october but this year because of covid you had to make a change Oh yeah, yes. This year was our 29th, and every year, and, and let me tell you, our dinners. Yeah, we have a dinners where we honor we honor people, um, and that's where we. This is it's our biggest fundraiser of the year, 
we, we pick seven or eight people, sometimes 10, it depends, you know, the boy says it. And, you know, um, and we, we honor people and we honor, we stay, we stay true to our core because it originally started as radio, records, and retail. Well, you know, we don't have retail like we used to, you know. <laughs> we remember the mom and pop stores. Um, um, always have to shout out to George Daniels, the godfather of, of black retail um, in Chicago. But, and then we started to add different categories, marketing, um, we now do digital. So there are people who are breaking, you know, the, the glass ceilings in some other areas, but who are doing extremely well. So we uh, have expanded that, but we now have that dinner every year for the last five or six years. It's been in Los Angeles um, at the Taglian um, Cultural Center. They've been very good partners with us. Um, but you said, as you said, this year we had a stellar lineup for our 29th. Um, and, but we had to cancel. We had to force, we took the foresight, the board of directors back in March when this thing started happening and saying, you know what, because even, even though it was in October, we'd have to start the preparations <laughs> you know, yeah, back then. Exactly. And so when the, the virus was happening and layoffs were beginning, it just didn't sit right to call people and ask for money <laughs> during a period of time. So we just made you know, a, a decision to, to not have the, the awards this year. And, uh, and we had a great lineup uh, awardees, but they have all agreed to be honored next year. Um, for our 30th, and it'll be our 30th anniversary. And so we're really excited about that. We're currently working on some other projects. We've done some things um, during Black Music Month, um, Black History Month, just to stay um, visible. Uh, we've got a, we're bringing in, and we've, uh, we've got an advisory board that has really invigorated the foundation, getting some new blood, because it's about having, being able to pass the torch you know, and that's what we're working on now is being able to create, just like someone passed the torch to me, I need to be able to pass the torch to someone else. So we want to continue this, this legacy because, again, when you think about what happens in our industry, our industry is a very, when you're making it, it's good and fun, but it can also be very cruel. You know, you know when people get out of work, they lose your number, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, you know who your friends are, yeah. yeah you, you find out who your friends are. Um, and so, you know, again, the, the foundation, and then, then we started our scholarship fund. Like I said, the scholarship fund, and now we're starting um, some other programs. We, we got to have a resource center because there are a lot of people out here who are trying to have their, start their careers. And there are also a lot of people out there who will just take their money, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. saying that, you know, I can do this and I can do that because, but we have a group that we know is with the integrity. We're like, hey, we, we don't take projects. So we don't. So we have from, if you need marketing, if you need promotions, if you need artist development, a lost art, um, if you need um, anything, you need, a, you need a press release written. We've got publicists, some of the best publicists, all a part of our, our foundation. So you know, we, we're going to create a resource center now. And then the next thing is really want to have a mentoring thing. A mentoring thing is really big because we owe a part of that as we're trying to help those who are being educated. We want to also foster them through um, their matriculations to stay connected and maybe help them get a job. But we also want to help those young executives who are now at these labels, who are facing challenges, who don't understand, um, you know, why they can't move in this, you know, because no one is showing them and nobody's inside really going to tell them. So mm -hmm. if you're in the dark, you need somebody to turn on the light. We want to be the people to come in and turn on the light. Yeah, which is exactly the way I felt coming into the industry. We won't go into how many years ago that was, but as you said earlier, that there was, you were competing against each other, but there was a lot of camaraderie and a lot of pulling forward and helping. And, and I think that's very important, especially now with, with everything that's going on right now. So that your the outreach you're talking about with the younger ones who were there, I think that's great. I think that's great. So speaking of which, you were there. I think well, you know you you knew Frankie, right? Or I know you know yes. who he was, but did you know him, Frankie yes. Crocker? I okay. did get to know. I you know what? I'm I'm like the luckiest kid in the world. Yeah. And I say that because growing up in New York City, I was a radio junkie, um, and 
at that time, I didn't even know that I really wanted to be in the business. I just loved entertainment. Um, but I grew up listening to Frankie Crocker when he was at WWRL. Um, oh, okay. And he was the love man. And he was hired by Jerry Bolden, who brought him to WWRL. And then WWRL also had Hank Spann, um, Jerry Bledsoe. They had one of the best airs talents. And I say I'm like the luckiest kid because I grew up and became friends with Frankie Crocker, Hank Spann, Jerry Bledsoe, all of the guys, the late Vaughn Harper, all those guys who, and ladies, you know, Deanna Williams, I told her I had a crush on her back in the day. She was my first radio crush. You know, um, when I got a chance to meet and befriend all these people. So I was like, Real? Yes. And so I'm living, I was living the dream job, if I you guess will. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, Frankie and Don, the late Don Cornelius, Don Cornelius, I'm looking at Soul Train every Sunday, every Saturday. And then yeah, I get, I, I get to go, work. right. And then I get to go to Soul Train. <laughs> and Don never called me by my first name. He always said, Linton. <laughs> and I hear him saying it now too. But Linton, yeah, exactly. you know, um, and then Sidney Miller, who had the mm -hmm. first, one of the first black trades, BRE, you know, who I used to read and was fortunate enough, he gave me a column, I wrote for him for a period of time. So, you know, mm -hmm. I've been very, very, very fortunate, but I think you were going somewhere else with that. So you no, just well, made no, it go. No, that's no, no, fine when you read. Wow, you brought up Hank Spann and I'm like, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, the soul stir. Those are great names, yeah. yeah. But the reason I brought up Frankie was because of the, in, in the wake of the show must be pause, everything that's been going on, uh, it heated up a debate again about urban versus black. And I know Frankie is the person in the mid seventies that coined the, the, the term urban contemporary. So I wanted to give you, have you give a little history lesson as to why that term came about, what it meant to black radio in terms of advertising and what your thoughts are now about the debate that's resurfaced. Well, as you know, I wrote an open letter, so it's, yeah. it's all out there, <laughs> but you know, the, um, the, you know, Frankie Crocker was definitely a visionary. He was always, um, he was always, he learned his lessons from Jerry. We all learned from Jerry in some way or another. Um, but Frankie was a very astute program director. He, he lived, he was in New York City, the number one market. And Frankie lived the lifestyle of New York. And I think that's what really attracted to me as a teenager, you know, like, uh -huh. he's cool, he's cool, got the pretty girls, and he looked like he's making a lot of money. Why not? Why not? Um, and so Frankie programmed WBLS, and, which was owned by Inner City Broadcasting, which was a Black-owned company, which was owned by, the chair was Percy Sutton, who was a former Manhattan Borough president, and who was Malcolm X's former attorney. Now you don't get no blacker than those those three no, things right there. Okay. You don't. Um, so he owned he owned in the city broadcasting. They had WBLS and WLIB. Um, they eventually owned the, the Apollo. And as a matter of fact, I think they were broadcasting out of the uh, Apollo building at, at first. So I don't get that mm -hmm. um, incorrect somewhere, right somewhere there on um, Linux, but on 125th Street. And but what eventually happened was WBLS became the number one rated radio station in the number one market. And, and I think I was talking to Charles Warfield, who is, uh, was the general manager, sales manager at that time. Um, they were like eighth in sales. Madison Avenue was not buying black radio because there was a stigma about black radio. You know, if you, before BLS, most of it was AM, so you had a lot of shotgun commercials, you had payday loans, you had all the beer you could drink, you know, because yeah. at that time you could still advertise beer and alcohol on the radio, <laughs> now you can't do that. So you had that TV. Uh, and so those things were being, those are the only sponsors they would get. And, you know, Frankie and his team there, tried to analyze what was going on and, and it was realized that they just, Madison Avenue didn't see black as being financially, you know, able to, to advertise to. So Frankie came up with the call, a term urban. His, his music was urban, which means it was for the city, but it was also urban coming from an urbane and a sophisticated sound because if you knew BLS then, 
It, mm -hmm. it was a very sophisticated sound. Um, and so urban, he coined the term urban contemporary, which took the black out of it, which didn't, didn't frighten Madison Avenue so much. It's crazy. It's just like people who say they don't want Obamacare, but they'll take the, the ACA. They'll take the, the Affordable <laughs> Care Act, but they don't want Obamacare. Duh. Mm -hmm. You know, and so with that became, and once he came up with that phrase, and then the white consultants who were programming black stations, they adapted it, urban contemporary. And then it went, it, it became a format. Now, from a radio standpoint, again, I've, I'm a program director now. I'm a, I'm a, la a former label executive. I understood the value of being urban in radio. I did not see what it meant inside the label, but it was, it was changed. And I don't know who changed it inside the label mm -hmm. um, because, and, but as it, the music was still black and from a creative standpoint, the music is black and the music is coming from the record companies. So if they're creating black music, and sending it out to radio stations for formats to play, whatever. You know, but we always put labels on things or we are reclassified. And so when radio, when the labels adopted the term urban, um, I think it just like white, just like uh, Madison Avenue didn't mm -hmm. feel as offended <laughs> and easier. I think it took, it made the people inside of the record labels feel better instead of saying the black music division, right. it's the urban department. So it was, I think, it, but it didn't really relate to the music because it wasn't, the music never changed. No, it was still R&B and then later R&B yeah, and yeah, rap. Yeah, no, yeah, the music never changed, just a description. And I think it just made it easier. And for me, two things. So inside of a label, and even in my, in my different positions, I never accepted that term in my title. I was either gonna be black music, or it's going to be R&B. So they even came to me one time when I was doing negotiations, want to make you the vice president of Urban. I said, nope, Urban. And when I said Black, they had a little pushed off. Black, well, you know, we're trying to have a colorblind company. You know, that, you know, this is going through negotiations. My, my attorney is telling me this. So I'm saying, well, well then let's just go with the R&B. I'll go with R&B because it's the closest thing to rhythm and blues. That's what it comes down to. Um, and so we went with that, but I never wanted that because I knew that inside the company, it didn't, it really didn't depict the music itself. That was a lifestyle. Urban is a lifestyle. And so, of course, they say hip hop is a lifestyle. Yes, but it still comes under the right, process umbrella. of black music. That's its genesis. Okay. Um, All right, cool. Did I cover that or... I, I think you covered, that. <laughs> you covered that. I wanted to uh, just, I don't know if you've seen, but I just wanted to give shout outs also to Jerry Limbo's in the room, Terry Rossi, Denise Brown, I think I saw her name. So, uh, oh, yeah. Terry Rossi, uh, Terry Rossi, definitely um, another one of those persons from the Living Legends, that one of those people that we don't have retail anymore. But, you know, when we go back to the Living Legends, Terry Rossi. One, the first woman to be at, uh, the, or the second one, because I think the first was on that Obama, but to be at WIA, One Electric Atlantic, in, in handling, no, Terry was over at BMG. Um, but to be, be in control of the retail dollars and mm -hmm. helping make sure that black music was in the right stores, is in the right, and we had positioning in stores. And she was able to hire people. Because back in the day, those of you, are all, those of you who only know digital, <laughs> there was a time when we had a thing called CDs and we put them in stores and they had to be positioned. Or even always, vinyl. Yeah, and even vinyl. And you're always positioned for, so when people went in, you know, you make sure your record was up front. <laughs> and there were some people would go and put yours in the back. So we always made sure that we were able to do that. And people like Terry Rossi or Netta Barber, um, they were the ones. Um, and then even prior to, her, there was, you know, people in, in retail that, um, you know, Jimmy Starks, if I think of my name with a Jimmy Starks, you know, these are names that people don't know, but they're part of the DNA and of history of, of black music and not just black music because black music is an American music. And then the thing, I'm in jazz radio now, the mm -hmm. original music art form. 
I don't talk to one black promotion person. I think that's a travesty. At one time, black music encompassed R&B, gospel, jazz, um, you know, hip hop, R&B. Well, then it was rap, but then it became hip hop. Right. You know, and some, some disco. And some disco. I mean, disco was nothing but R&B sped up. Exactly. Um, you know, um, and so when so when those divisions went away, that music was scattered about. Um, and today that I'm back in jazz radio, talking to promotions people, and the irony is I'm talking to these people. These are people that I either worked with or I knew, but they were all doing pop. They were doing pop top 40 promotion at the time. Mm -hmm. Now they've all transitioned to jazz. Black executives have no place to transition. Help. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, you talked earlier about gut feeling and I st and, and, and folks complain that maybe it's more, as you mentioned, the word being counter. Um, you know, a lot of some people will say assembly line, whatever, same kind of a sound, but talk about, I'm looking at the plaques on the back of your wall. I wish I had as many as you do, but um, talk about gut feeling. What, what record? I know you worked with, the, with the Usher and other people. So was there a record? Can you give us an anecdote about a song that you knew or an album that you knew was going to blow up or an artist that you just had a gut feeling about? Forget the promotion, for, forget the chart information every week. Just an anecdote um, along those lines. You know, and I, you know, you know, I came into Arister um, just as um, Clyde was putting his joint ventures together. I was, you know, Jean Riggers is the one who hired me. She was okay, the senior Jean, vice president. Okay. She was the senior vice president of Black Music. Um, and I was replacing another good promotion person, um, Doug Daniels, who was just leaving. Um, and Lionel Ridenow was there, who at the time was the national director and eventually became vice president and senior. Um, so I missed some of the very first songs that came out. Like I came right as Juicy for Biggie was peaking, but worked the rest of the project. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one... The, I put it like this, there was an artist that I knew was, was going to be a hit and all he needed was a hit song and that was Usher. Okay. Usher's first album, which was produced by Puffy before Puffy actually blew up. I think if we re-released that album after Puffy had really blown up with Bad Boy, it might have been a hit just on the strength. <laughs> okay. But his first, you know, L.A. Reid and Babyface um, had great acumen for talent. They found some great talent and they were, they're music guys, songwriters, um, you know, and they signed this, this young kid who had the chops, but just didn't have the right song. And I knew that Usher, and I'm gonna tell you when I knew Usher would be a hit artist. I took him on a promotion tour and you know, I'm the new guy at the, at the company. So, you know, you could, you, you know, why don't you just go on the road and meet people and let them know that you're here, which is okay. <laughs> and we were down in uh, Montgomery, um, Alabama. Um, and went out to a festival for a radio station and Usher was getting ready to perform and it started raining. Two things happened. It started raining, the crowd started getting smaller and number two, the sound went out. Now, a lot of artists will stop singing and say, yo man, turn the sound up, turn the sound up. Yo man, I, you know, turn the track. Usher did none of that. He kept singing while the sound was out, when they got the song, the sound right, he was right where he was supposed to be. He continued to sing in the rain as the crowd got smaller. He, he performed like he was performing before 10,000 people. And when we came off, I, I, said, to him, I said to him and, and, and his mother who was with him, I said, all we need is the right record. I said, your son is gonna be it, he's, he's a star. And then the next thing you know, you make me want to came out the second, the first song from his second <laughs> album and the rest is history. <laughs> exactly. So, wow. you know, I, you know, just having that. And then I think from a song perspective, you know, I, I guess one of my big victories, um, me and the late um, Vanessa Barrier, you know, when I went to work for Clive, my first, my whole interview was about Deborah Cox. 
I mean, the entire interview was about Deborah Cox. She's getting ready to release her first single in her first mm-hmm. album, Sentimental. Um, Clyde will play a song to you for a thousand times. <laughs> you can't say that's enough. You just got to sit there and endure it. You know, so I'm interviewing for the job. He says, you think you can deliver this record? I'm not going to say no. No. <laughs> so, no. So we, long story short, we did release Sentimental. We did take it number one, top 10. I got to, still got a scar on my back. But because um, it was a work record, as we like to say back in the day. But me, Lionel, and Gene and the team, we, we brought it home. And then when, when it was time for Deborah's second album, it was about picking a single. And we, she had a song with all these great producers. You know, she had up-tempo songs from Stevie J, who came from the Hitman with Puffy. But she had this ballad called Nobody Wants to Be Here. And I think everybody in the room knew it was a hit, but nobody wanted to release it as the first <laughs> single. That's always, you know, you say, and I will never forget telling Clive, we'd always have a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Clive, I said, this is the song. Me and Vanessa was, she, we stood up in that, in the big meeting, because he has his Thursday meetings. And we said, this is the record, this is the record. So. We finished the meeting. Then he calls me up to his office, calls us up to his office, me and Lionel. Is this the record? Um, and I think Lionel even wanted an up-tempo record. And I was like, this is, this is it. And Clive, in, uh, in a very nice way, was pretty much says, are you ready to put the family Jews on the line for this song? I said, mm, let me go to Chicago and I'll be right back and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew in my heart that was the right thing. But I, I went to Chicago. There was a music convention that weekend. Um, okay. that, um, and I played it for a couple of program directors and they came back and they said yes because our thought was if you don't come with the first single she doesn't mm-hmm. have a career mm-hmm. she's over mm-hmm. uh, he acquiesced the song became her anthem big record number one we were vindicated and then Clive always says I knew the first time I heard this record it was a hit <laughs> There was no other choice. <laughs> and that's his prerogative, you know? Exactly. Um, but yeah, but I really, I think that was one that I always uh, feel I'd be, you know, great artist, love Deborah and, and, and her husband. And, um, but that was one we fought for because okay. we knew that that was, that was the right way to, right to go. So we're going to wrap up with this last question, uh, David, which is um, what advice can you give um, young minority executives who want to get into the music industry or are already in and trying to maneuver their way up the proverbial ladder? Well, I tell you, um, I think you got to, it still goes back to learning everything and not segregate yourself. You know, when I went, when I was in the industry, I went to Every, when I went, my company had an event, I went. It was, I was in the black music division, but if they had something going on in the jazz or they had something going on in the, the pop, when I was in Dallas, I went to more rock shows. I went to, I went to some hillbilly places down in Texas that today I might not go, but <laughs> I went, I, because I became a part of the company, you know, and I wanted to learn what my counterparts learn. And sometimes you can't learn from afar so you have to really make yourself a part of the, the, the company. You've got to really network. And then you've got to let people know your aspirations. You know, people are not just going to automatically give you, because I know that there are several executives who are in companies now who could run the other side. They could be not just in the black or urban department. And that's why a lot of the executives don't want to use the term urban because they think it's holding them back. But it's not mm-hmm. holding them back. That's not holding you back. It's the culture and the thought process. But right. I think if you were to ingratiate yourself into the business and learn all you learn, you may not get it there, but you'll get it somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah, you know, you'll, you'll get, because once you have the knowledge, nobody can take it from you. And again, you know, there's so many independent artists out here looking for, you know, growth. Labels, labels really have to always defi- redefine themselves because at one time they were the all in the be all. Artists can now make a record without a label. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can create a video without a label. You know, 
the thing the label does is give them that little extra push and, um, you know, marketing. Yeah. marketing. So, you know, I always subscribe to what Master P and those guys say, you know what, you could, have, you could sell a million and wind up still living at mom's or you could sell a hundred thousand and own all the profit so, or 50,000 to own all the profit. Okay. So I think just learning the game and learning the, 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 the mass of the game, but learn the game, um, you know, learn the business, you know, we call it the game, but it's not a game, it's a business. And if you learn that business mm -hmm. and find someone who can teach you, be open, remain coachable. I'm still coachable. You know, I still learn, even at the foundation, as we're growing and expanding, we're working on putting a podcast together that we're hoping to bring out in, in the, before the year is out. But we're learning, you can constantly learn how to do things. And so I think if I had to give any advice to them, be open to, um, be open to learning, accept criticism, you know, that's how you get better. If everybody tells you you're good, you're good, you're good, you'll never get better because somebody's lying to you. <laughs> great, great. Well, thanks so much, David. Um, we got a lot of great comments. Miller just said two of my favorite people, Gail and David, great job. So thank you because it's, it's, it was a chance to catch up with you because we, we won't be able to this October. But uh, I know. thank you. And, and Tom, thank you for the opportunity uh, and the invitation to do this with David. Yeah, I thank you, Tom, so much. And please, don't be shy. If you want to go to livinglegendsfoundation.com and make a contribution, feel free to do so. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's tax deductible. Um, and we would love to, uh, to have you to go to our website and just learn more about what we do. And thank you again, Tom, for this opportunity. Well, all the thanks go to you guys. And I just, again, want to say how amazing you are and what an inspiration you both are. I learned more in the last hour and I, all the comments of my text has been blowing up during the whole thing for people patting me on the back for this. So again, I thank you for sharing your wisdom and your history. And I, I look forward to coming back and doing this uh, at a later date as well. Oh, Folks, thank, awesome. please do. Um, folks, a couple final comments. Next Thursday at the same time, we'll be doing this again. And next week, our guests are Burtis Downs, who is REM's longtime lawyer, is coming back in the interview seat to interview Susan Jenko, who is the president of Azoff Companies. In essence, Susan Jenko is Irving Azoff's right hand. It's going to be a fascinating discussion, and I invite you to come back. And lastly, I want to finish as I always do, and that is wear one of these. It is not a big deal. And the sooner everyone out there wears one of these, the sooner we can get back to seeing people like David Linton and Gail Mitchell in person at, at big concerts. So please do so. Wear one of these and be safe. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. All right.